the U.S. Census says 46 million live in poverty. It's the highest in decades. And for a family of four, poverty is defined as living with an income of 22,000 or less. Nearly 50 million have no health insurance and basic needs are becoming unaffordable for many. In neighborhoods across the U.S., the face of poverty has changed. 15% of Americans live impoverished. That's the highest of any industrialized nation in the world. Many folks are just one paycheck away from being part of the poverty issue. The past four years has not been easy, and millions of Americans have taken it hard. We have seen the, the face of poverty really change. It's no longer people who have been in a cyclical you know, cycle of poverty, but it's families who have been unemployed, who have kids. Just a few faces of the poor in America. In a time when jobs are scarce, solutions seem out of sight, and the emotional toll on families is perhaps the most devastating of all. This town of 3,000 people has a 50% unemployment rate, no police force, no schools, and no public service. The New York Times wrote about a really great uh, study that Stanford researchers did to see uh, the achievement gap between the rich and the poor. Now oftentimes you hear about an achievement gap uh, between the races, between whites and blacks. However, there's very little information on income, right? Usually the income is related to a race and then researchers try to find a gap when it comes to race and education achievement and stuff. But what they found here is that your income level plays a larger role in your academic achievement than your race. If they're not living in the car right now, they are avoiding it. Some of them don't even have cars to live in, or they recently got out of it. Why is it happening right now? The longevity of homelessness continues to rise. So people are running out of resources. The unemployment runs out, their savings run out, the family that lent them money does not have it anymore because they're looking at economic hardship. And before you know it, they find themselves living in their car because they just ran out of all options. Before the bell, they blend in with more than 1,100 other homeless students in the Seminole County Schools. How long have you been living in this truck? About five months. What's that like? It's an adventure. Yeah, that's how we see it. When kids at school ask you where you live, what do you tell them? When they see the truck, they ask me if I live in it, and when I hesitate, they kind of realize. And they say they won't tell anybody. And yeah, it's not really that much of an embarrassment. I mean, it's only life. You do what you need to do, right? It's life for a lot of folks. The number of kids in poverty in America is pushing toward 25%, one out of four. At Castleberry School, we met 15 kids who'd been living in cars.
when it came time to put the girls in school, the school must have asked you for an address. That, okay, well, you have these boxes to choose, and you had one that said shelter. You checked the shelter box? Yeah. There was no box for car? No. So you lied to them? Basically. You do what you have to do. There was not an option to take my girls away. My name is Cedric Forte. I'm a junior at Heritage High School, 425. Um, my name is Jackson Langbord. I'm 18 year old and I'm a senior at McLean High School. For academic subjects, I'm in Advanced Placement Literature, English, Advanced Placement uh, U.S. Government, Biology, and Comparative Government, Art, Advanced Placement Music Theory, Health, uh, Geosystems for Science, and Algebra, Men's Course, What's it? Leadership, and Technical Theater. They looked at standardized tests and they saw that uh, the test scores between affluent and low income students has grown by 40% since the 1960s. That is double the gap between blacks and whites. A lot of students who go to a school all the way across town have to catch two and three buses in the subway just to get to school and I think that, you know, if we have to travel that far just to get education, then we should, we should be able to travel for free. Uh, income inequality has real results, and what it does is it strips people of opportunity. And that's the most important part of it, because it's okay if people are richer, of course, we get it, we're capitalists, we're Americans, yada yada, right? But if the whole premise is that we all have a shot at it. Yes. It Kids here are motivated in just about everything. They're motivated to even learn, which is scary to hear for a high school kid. They're motivated to succeed in sports, extracurriculars, anything. I think they've lost the will to learn. A lot of them, they just like don't find school interesting no more because they don't have the power to do anything and to say so in the classroom. You can't really pinpoint one reason as to why there's a lower uh, achievement level among those from a lower income. Uh, so there are all these little elements that come into play, but the element that I found the most interesting had to do with the number of hours affluent children spend outside of their homes versus the number of hours poor kids spend outside of their homes. And this is during the developmental phase uh, from when they are born till the age of about six years old. And it turns out that kids that are born in affluent families are more likely to spend longer hours outside of the home. This is our auditorium and theater. Uh, we have lights, standard light sound. It's not particularly high tech, but it's, it's, we have a nice system. Here, go to the metal detector. Like, they use this to try to, you know, keep school safe, but obviously it doesn't work because, like, even when someone walks through and it beeps, like, they don't even search them or anything. They just say, okay, walk back through, empty your pockets. That's all they do. This is our new studio. It's one of three high schools in the county who has it. Hey, orchestra. Can you start playing? It's all kids. It's all run. It's all performed. It's all produced by kids. Well, one thing that these walls, like, they really need to be repainted because the graffiti, like, as you can see here, they tried to repaint it, but it doesn't blend in. You can actually tell they just, like, really just gave up on repainting the walls, so. Every teacher in this school buys their own school supplies. And it's actually very sad because like the school system should have money to, you know, provide for those school supplies for students, but they don't. And the teachers have to come out of their paycheck just to, you know, be able to support their students. Uh, that's our observatory. It's just it's a giant dome with a telescope. And you can see the entire sky from there. If every school in the country can be like McLean, I think it's really going to increase standard of living, uh, just going to make things a lot better. Obviously, it's not fair, 
I mean, we have not even half of what they have. I mean, we're all students. Why shouldn't we receive the things that they have? I mean, we're all trying to learn. We're all, we all want to grow up to be something, so why shouldn't we receive the same advantages they have? I don't understand that. Why do uh, richer kids do better on the SATs? Well, that's because they took an SAT prep class, right? right? You know, and they had tutors, etc. Not all of them, but a, a lot of them, and so they wind up having this huge advantage. Or they go to a private school, they get better training, more assistance outside the home. Earlier on, they do more activities, you know, intramural soccer, or piano, whatever it might be, and all of those help tremendously in the development of kids. And part of the reason that poor people can't do that as well is because they got two jobs. They're trying to make things happen. The dad's working, the mom's working. Who's got time to drive the kids to soccer practice? Education is a great equalizer, mm -hmm. and if it turns out you don't have a shot at it uh, because the odds are skewed against you, well then, then we got a real problem. After school, the Metzgers drive their truck to the library. Because they've got the computers that we can use and light and all that. I wonder what education means to you two. I mean, it's everything. it is everything to us. I plan to be a child defense lawyer. If I focus on my studies, I have that opportunity. The American dream is durable, and there is something about growing up in a truck that makes you believe in it all the more.